Dear colleagues, thank you for joining us today to the live webinar focusing on the highlights of this year's annual ACC meeting, which took place last weekend from Saturday to Monday. We will spend the next two hours to learn about the most relevant trials picked by an amazing group of people. They agreed to participate um, on a very short notice. Um, thank you for, uh, for your efforts. Thank you very much. Some of the presenters are still on the board. They will join in later. Uh, some of them have to leave earlier. I think everyone understands, especially during this extraordinary times. Um, is, let me give you an overview of what we'll discuss today. Uh, Dr. Kessler from Munich, the former national speaker of the Young Dezidak, will start with data on CAD, follow, uh, followed by Dr. Valentova from Göttingen, who will discuss biomarker studies. We will end this uh, first session with Dr. Trübs from Mainz, um, who is speaker of the Young Dezidak uh, there, um, who will discuss news data on cardiac imaging. The second session will start with a great talk by Dr. Trippel from Berlin, who will present the most debated study from the ACC conference and other data regarding heart failure. Uh, Dr. Kevampur from Heidelberg, who is also the former speaker of the Young Dezidra in Heidelberg, will focus on cardiomyopathies, her field of expertise. Thank you very much. And I would love to especially welcome our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Doka from Hanover. He's an attending cardiologist at the University Hospital over there. I'm sure all of you know him from the DGK, the German Cardiac Society. He will give us insights into his field of expertise, electrophysiology. And we will end our sessions with a very interesting talk by Dr. Ludwig from Hamburg, who will discuss the latest data on valvular diseases. Each talk will take 10 minutes, followed by a five minutes Q&A session. We're looking forward to your questions. You can write them either in the YouTube comments or in the WhatsApp group. The link to the WhatsApp group was sent together with the invitation to today's event. We'll have the possibility of extra Q&A sessions if we manage to stick to the schedule, which is dependent on the, um, on the presenters and uh, my skills in managing the time. Uh, so, guys, I'm very much looking forward to learning from you. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thanks again for your efforts. Dear Thorsten, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, so I hope you can see me. Greetings from Munich. Thank you, Javid, for organizing this. And I hope everyone can see the slides in a minute. Just a second. So does it work? I hope it works. Okay, so I am, it's a pleasure for me to present you some data from clinical trials focusing on coronary artery disease. And within the next minutes, I want to talk about two particular trials. The first trial is the Taylor PCI trial, which um, investigated the implementation of uh, pharmacogenetic testing after PCI. So we will come to that in a minute. And the second trial also focuses on antiplatelet therapy. It's the TICO trial, a trial that investigated the therapy after stenting um, with Ticacolor only without aspirin after three months. So to give you some background again, uh, when we talk about the first trial, um, I have shown on this slide the current strategy after implementa implementation of coronary stents in different scenarios. So on the left side, you see a stable coronary artery disease or chronic coronary syndrome. In the middle, it's the um, non-ST elevation acute coronary syndrome. And on the right side, ST elevation myocardial infarction. And in principle, the therapy nowadays is that if there's no high bleeding risk after in stable coronary artery disease, patients receive aspirin lifelong. And then in addition, clopidogrel for six months. In acute coronary syndrome, the scenario is different. Patients usually receive aspirin lifelong. And in addition for 12 months, a second uh, agent, uh, ADP receptor antagonist, but in this case, not clopidogrel, so preferably ticaculor or brasicril. And this is also reflected in the guidelines. So as you can see here for chronic coronary syndrome, there's a class one indication for clopidogrel unless 
there are circumstances that speak against clopidogrel or maybe high risk of stent thrombosis, which would then also justify brazoquil or ticagrelor. But in the scenario of acute coronary syndrome, um, brazoquil or ticagrelor are recommended in addition to aspirin to reduce the risk of ischemic events after the implementation of coronary stents. So why or what's the difference between these? So most of you probably know that clopidogrel has a quite complicated mode of activation in the liver. So there is there are two steps of, of a cytochrome P450 mediated activation process to activate clopidogrel as a prodrug into the active metabolite. Brazocryl, in contrast, also um, undergoes metabolization, but this is not as critical as in clopidogrel. And ticagrelor is different again because it is active itself, and it, but it's also metabolized, but the metabolites are also active. So this is the difference and one reason why it's thought that they are more potent um, also than uh, clopidogrel. And regarding this metabolism, there's already some data showing that this plays a role and this is relevant. So this is a paper from more than 10 years ago, which has already shown that if you have two variant alleles, which is shown in red here, of a cytochrome P enzyme that is less active, so there's less active metabolite of clopidogrel, then your risk of death, myocardial infarction, or stroke is increased. And this was actually also the rationale for um, performing um, the Taylor PCI trial. And there's already a second paper which has been published last year, which has shown that the genotype guided strategy um, is non inferior to a strategy using uh, one of the more potent uh, antagonists for ADP. So currently, there's no evidence that, or no recommendation in the guidelines that genetics should be tested. Um, before prescribing clopidogrel. And there's currently uh, obviously also a need for prospective trials to show whether it makes sense to genotype patients uh, to um, provide something for an individualized treatment um, after stenting. So this trial included more than 5,000 patients who um, received a PCI with at least one stent for stable coronary artery disease, but also acute coronary syndrome and required 12 months of dual antiplatelet therapy. And the patients were then randomized to receive either the conventional therapy or the genotype guided therapy. And what that means is shown in this figure. So it's a quite complicated scheme here. So the patients after including in the study were randomized into these both arms, um, conventional and genotype guided. And then the patients in the conventional arm were treated with clopidogrel. And then after 12 months, they were genotyped. And in the other group, there was a point of care testing for the genotype. And then if they carried the loss or reduced functional yields for this enzyme, they received ticagrelor. And in any other case, they received clopidogrel. So, and then they were genotyped again after 12 months using a conventional assay. And in the end, these two groups, you can see here, were compared with each other. So the carriers of these loss of function alleles that were treated with clopidogrel or ticagrelor. What was the primary endpoint? This was a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, stroke, ischemia, and stent thrombosis. Finally, um, there was an analysis of more than 900 patients in each group. Um, quite normal coronary artery disease patients, uh, rather about 60 years old, most of them men and a quarter had diabetes. And interestingly, uh, more than 80% presented with acute coronary syndrome. So coming to the results, the primary endpoint uh, occurred in 4% of the genotype guided group compared to almost 6% in the conventional group. And this is at the borderline of being significant, but it's not significant. Um, there was also no difference regarding the safety endpoint of bleeding, but there was an in interesting pre-specified analysis that pre specifically looked at the, the acute phase after implementation of stents, so the first three months. And interestingly, there was really a 80% reduction of the primary endpoint in the genotype-guided therapy group. There was also a pre-specified sensitivity analysis for the primary endpoint regarding recurrent events. And also here, they saw a 40% reduction 
um, in the endpoint. So what are the conclusions from these trials? They missed the endpoint by statistical means, but the genetic testing may have a benefit, in particular during this high-risk period, and further studies are obviously needed to see whether this is true. The second trial, as I already mentioned, also is focusing on antiplatelet therapy after stenting in acute coronary syndrome. It's the TICO trial. And again, here you see we're now in this uh, uh, situation where we usually have aspirin lifelong and prasacryl or ticaclor for 12 months at least after PCI. So to the background, there has been a study by Roxanne Rahn and colleagues, the Twilight trial, which, which has already shown in a placebo controlled scenario that three months of antiplatelet therapy are um, possible without higher risk of death, myocardial infarction or stroke. And uh, this was also um, objective of the TICO trial. In this trial, um, a bit more than 3,000 patients with acute coronary syndromes in South Korea have been included. They all received PCI with a, a special stand, uh, Ozero ultra thin stand with a bioresorbable polymer. Also, these patients were around 60 years old. Most of these were men. And they were randomized after this index PCI to either the normal treatment, 12 months dual antiplatelet therapy with Ticacrylor or um, dual th therapy for three months, followed by the Ticacrylor monotherapy. And here, this was a quite interesting endpoint, NACE, because it's a composite of MACE and major bleeding, like a, a net um, outcome um, endpoint. So here you can see the results. And um, the primary endpoint, so NACE, occurred in 3.9% of the monotherapy group compared uh, to a higher incidence in the 12 months group. And uh, this is shown here below. And this was mainly driven, interestingly, by a reduced risk of bleeding in the group of patients which only received Ticacrylor after three months uh, compared to the 12 months group. So in this line, also here, they didn't see a difference regarding maze between the groups. And there was also no difference regarding stent thrombosis between the two groups. So that the, um, and there was also a pre-specified subgroup analysis which did not show a difference um, or uh, disadvantage for the ticacular monotherapy, um, but uh, one group maybe has better outcome with dual antiplatelet therapy, and these might be the patients with multivessel disease. So the authors conclude that ticacular monotherapy could be a strategy for patients with acute coronary syndrome, especially if uh, they are at high bleeding risk. And I think for both of these studies, we will have to, to wait until the final manuscripts are available to really dig into um, these studies. But I hope I could show you some insights from these trials from the virtual ACC meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. And I invite um, all the uh, other colleagues uh, to join in in the discussion. Um, what do you what do you think um, is Tosna? Are you do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Very good. Because your camera was off for a moment. Um, so patients with ACS, do you see a difference, uh, or would you think that there is a difference between um, instable angina and patients with you know with proponent, so patients who had a myocardial infarction? I think we, we need to see the final manuscript to really evaluate this. Um, but in the end, we also don't know whether Ticacrylor might be the right agent here in, in this regard. So these uh, studies um, have, so, so they have been designed long before. So for example, the ESA REACT-5 trial. So actually we are completely off Ticacrylor in our hospital. We are only using Brazacryl. So this is one question, of course. And on the other hand, which has been discussed a lot at the ACC, or at least it's at the virtual ACC, it seems, is uh, whether aspirin alone could also have this effect. So how is it if you stop Ticacrylor? So I think there's much more data needed uh, for um, evaluating this, in particular regarding um, a myocardial infarction and unstable angina, but also um, um, to see in other treatment strategies. 
So I think the data is really good if you have a patient with a high bleeding risk, because then you can also think about giving Tegravir alone. So I think that's that's uh, quite clear from these studies with the caution that the, these are particular stents that have been used in these trials. So we also don't know whether it's applicable to all kinds of stents that are implanted all over the world. So at least we do not use this Ozero stent. Okay. Um, have you stopped your screen sharing uh, to see you better? Because at the moment it's, it seems that it's still on and we see you only uh, in a little window. Um, I thought Okay, um, I would. Uh, there is a question uh, asked on the YouTube uh, in the YouTube comments, um, which is, uh, Dr. Kessa, thank you for the very interesting talk. Uh, would it make more sense to treat with clopidogrel when indicated and check the activity of clopidogrel? Uh, I believe a test with a PFA hundred should be cheaper and provide similar results. Okay. Interesting question um, and also makes sense. So um, we are indeed performing platelet aggregation testing after um, implementation of coronary stents. And um, it's something which is really uh, fast and cheap. That's true. Um, I think a major drawback in the past could have been uh, genetic testing because it took very long. So one thing that has also been discussed in the social media about this Taylor PCI trial was that it's really fascinating that they had this point of care test, which allowed them to, to have a result within like 60, 60 minutes. So I think this might a bit change the scenario because you, um, it might also be quite cheap in the future. Um, you have it uh, in the cath lab maybe, and this doesn't change over life. So you get, get the information that um, is true for the whole life and a really valuable information. So I think um, for the efficacy of, of antiplatelet agents might be in the acute setting uh, sufficient to look at platelet aggregation, but it's a very interesting information you get from genetic testing. Very good. Very good. And uh, do you think that, you know, or do you think the constellation of the acuteness of the patient yeah. Whether um, how much do you think uh, has or what's the impact of the of the inflammatory levels um, on the on the substrate uh, you use, you know, the drug you use? Because I imagine a stabby patient um, who comes in has a very different uh, um, systemic response than a patient who comes in with an instable angina um, but without any myocardial uh, myocardial damage. Yeah, it's also a very good question. So, and, and there's a lot we don't know in, in, in these uh, scenarios. So that's also maybe a problem we have in, the, in cardiogenic shock, for example. So where we do not feel really good uh, giving a patient clopidocryl and um, because it might, takes very, it might take very long. We, with Ticacolor, you have the possibility to receive a, a very fast response to it or maybe in the future could also be can canker law uh, an option. So um, I think that's also a reason why these more potent agents might be superior to clopidocryl. But in the end, uh, regarding the inflammation levels in these patients, I'm not aware of, of really good data um, that can justify um, giving um, clopidogrel in this situation. And also, which is very interesting, as you have seen, most of the patients in this trial um, had an acute coronary syndrome. Nevertheless, they were treated with clopidogrel. So uh, that's interesting at some point. So, and not what we would do uh, in our uh, clinical practice. So I think um, the genotype guided therapy would rather be interesting in the setting of chronic coronary syndrome, where you want to reduce the incidence of stent thrombosis by giving patients maybe more potent ADP receptor antagonists. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And Dietosten, uh, you're welcome to join in for the Q&A sessions. Uh, best regards to Munich. Thank you. And I invite Dr. Valentova from uh, Göttingen to give us a talk on biomarkers. Hi, Miro. Hi, David. 
Thank you for the introduction. I will now share the screen. Perfect. Okay. Well, I had been watching the ACC sessions to provide you with uh, newest information from the field of cardiovascular biomarkers. Well, it seems that the novel research is slowly going away from the traditional circulating markers, such as anti-proBNP, to markers which reside in our genes, the so-called genetic biomarkers. Well, genetic biomarkers can help us to identify individuals at risk at early age, but not only that, they can also um, can be used, they can be used in clinical trials to guide treatment, as I will show you later. Well, a very nice overview about the role of genetic markers for risk of myocardial infarction uh, was given by Dr. Katya Reeson from Newton in Massachusetts in the Eugene Brownwald keynote on Sunday. He classified genetic markers into three groups. Monogenic markers, um, where a single mutation is sufficient to lead a patient to an early myocardial infarction. For example, um, familial hypercholesterolemia, where we find markedly elevated levels of LDL and triglycerides due to a single gene mutation. In contrast to that, a polygenic marker expresses a risk that is based on multiple gene variations. Polygenic risk scores have gained a lot of interest over the last years, since they can be used in population-wide primary prevention for cardiovascular diseases. And the third group are um, somatic markers, uh, which are based on somatic mutations. These mutations um, we don't inherit from our parents, but we develop them in our own lifetime. Um, these mutations developed um, in, develop in our hematopoietic stem cell, which leads to a clone of leukocytes um, that expresses adverse inflammatory behavior, which leads to an early myocardial infarction. Uh, in his talk, Dr. Katerison showed how frequent these genetic markers can be found in patients with early myocardial infarction. And when we look at 100 patients with early myocardial infarction, then the majority of them, um, almost 20%, um, present with a high polygenic score. In contrast to that, um, the presence of a monogenic marker or of clonal hematopoiesis is less frequent, but if present, they carry similar risk than a high polygenic score. Now, knowing this, knowing that the relevant number of our patients have a high polygenic risk, raises the question whether this is a destiny or whether we can do something about that and treat them early. This question has been addressed uh, by the talk given by Dr. Fierens from the University of Cambridge. He and his colleagues, um, they studied polygenic risk score and um, the effect of polygenic risk score on major coronary events, um, together with the effect of LDL cholesterol and systolic blood pressure. So what you see in the figure is um, on the y-axis are um, the major coronary events. And on the x-axis, uh, you see the quintiles for polygenic risk score in these light blue bars. And as you see with each quintile of polygenic risk score, the risk for major coronary events um, was increasing. However, what Dr. Fierens pointed out is that there's risk can be significantly modified by LDL and systolic blood pressure, which means that if you have um, a high LDL and systolic blood pressure, then this risk, for example, in the highest PGS score, significantly increases. And in the opposite, if your LDL and 
blood pressure is low, then the risk drops down actually to a level which is even lower than the natural risk in the lowest BGS quintile. Well, Dr. Firenze concluded that PGS um, can be used to identify individuals at risk early in life. And these individuals can benefit from early introduction of proven risk reducing interventions. However, the genetic risk is not a destiny since it can be effectively modified by targeting LDL and systolic blood pressure. Now, um, I would like to give you an example how um, monogenic markers can be used in clinical trials. In the previous talk, Dr. Kessler presented the results of the Taylor PCI trial. And um, as he already mentioned in the experimental arm, um, the patients were um, actually tested for a genetic marker, which was um, the loss of function variant of the CYP2C19 um, gene. And um, in the presence of this loss of function variant, they were put on ticagrelor instead of clopidogrel. So this gives us a sense on how a genetic marker of a decreased response to a drug can guide our treatment choice in the future. Now, um, for those of you who are waiting to hear some news on traditional biomarkers, I have something for you too. Um, Dr. Cunningham presented a post hoc analysis of the Paragon HF trial that addresses the effect of sacubitril vasartan on antipro BNP, as well as potential of the antipro BNP to predict outcomes in patients with heart failure with preserved it preserved uh, ejection fraction. Results of the main trial were published last year in New England Journal of Medicine. And as we know, um, the, the study actually narrowly missed to reduce the primary endpoint, which was a combined endpoint of, of uh, hospitalization and cardiovascular death uh, by a p-value of 0.06. The Paragon age of trial enrolled patients uh, with ejection fraction of 45% or higher, and uh, antipro BNP was one of the eligibility criteria uh, with uh, a cutoff value depending on admission status and also depending on the presence of atrial fibrillation. Since we know that patients with atrial fibrillation have higher antipro BNP levels, uh, the entry antipro BMP for these patients was, was set higher in this study. Just very briefly, uh, this figure shows what we already know, namely that um, on the x-axis you see, you see the uh, screening antipro BMP, and on the y-axis you see um, the, the events, and as you see antipro BMP uh, predicts outcome uh, very well. What is really new in this study um, is the evidence that the presence of atrial fibrillation modifies antipro BMP risk reduction. Patients with high antipro BMP had actually high even rate regardless of the presence of atrial fibrillation. However, when we look at antipro BMP of um, about 1,000 and compares these two groups, then we see that patients with atrial fibrillation had lower event rate compared to patients without atrial fibrillation. Well, this is very interesting. Um, Dr. Cunningham warned that we should not misunderstand this finding as a protective effect of atrial fibrillation. He suggested that this, this finding is rather explained by the fact that atrial fibrillation causes an increase in antipro BMP that is independent of heart failure risk. These data suggest that heart failure clinical trials should apply a higher minimum antipro BMP entry criteria for patients with atrial fibrillation. The presence of obesity also significantly modified risk prediction by antipro BNP. 
the relationship um, between anti-ProBNP and event rate was weaker in obese patients compared to non-obese patients. As we know, obese patients tend to have low anti pmp levels for a given degree of heart failure. However, already at low anti pmp levels, obese patients retained a moderate event rate. Thus, lower anti pmp in obese patients does not mean a low event rate. The treatment with sacrobitual vasartan led to a significant decrease in anti pro BNP um, compared to vasartan only. And this result was uh, very consistent in um, every key subgroup. Especially, there was um, no difference regarding of gender and regarding of ejection fraction. This is a very important finding since we know that in the main trial, female and patients with lower ejection fraction actually showed a possible benefit with sacrobitual vasartan. Dr. Cunningham suggested that this benefit cannot be explained by a different reduction of anti pro BNP. Altogether, I would summarize that this analysis raises a discussion about how we design future heart failure trials in terms of anti pro BMP cutoffs. Thank you. Thank you, Miro. Thank you very much. Um, in the uh, Paragon trial, um, uh, we had different um, levels to get in, um, and, you know, to be included in the, in the trial, to be enrolled. Um, which was, which is you know, a pretty unique approach to, um, to heart failure studies. Uh, what do you think, you know, because we know or we have known for a long time that atrial fibrillation increases uh, anti-pro BMP levels. Uh, what do you think, you know, why uh, haven't we included this criterion in, in previous trials? And I think, uh, especially in HFPEF, where we lack any special treatment, we might have biased our studies by not having um, this, uh, this parameter included or adjusted? Well, this is the question. Yes, at the end, when you design a study, you need to make a decision, right? And I think based on this data, I think that this, the decision was a correct one to set a higher anti pro -BMP level for patients with atrial fibrillation to enter the study um, because you don't have patients who have only atrial fibrillation and only because of atrial fibrillation, they have high anti pro -BMP and they maybe don't really have heart failure. You don't want to treat them with this novel drug and you don't want to bias your um, results at the end. So knowing the, the results of this post hoc analysis, I would say that the definition, the decision to uh, make different cutoffs for different patients is actually a, um, a good one. But, and of course, you end up mixing very, very different subgroups of patients. You have obese patients with and without atrial fibrillation, you have non obese patients with and without atrial fibrillation. So, the question is rather whether it would be better to design a study where you um, kind of include only patients without atrial fibrillation, for example, or with atrial fibrillation only, where you don't mix up all the subgroups so much. But at the end, I think that we will learn from each trial and we, and each trial will probably help us to um, design every new trial um, a little bit better. Very good. Um, do you think, you know, with having this inclusion criteria, we want to make sure that people have heart failure and not and do not suffer from something else? And second, to a bit, you know, uh, increase the probability to uh, measure the endpoints. Um, do you yes. think that anti-pro BNP 
maybe that's a parameter we shouldn't use when people, uh, when patients have uh, atrial fibrillation. Maybe that's something for only sinus rhythm patients and because there is no added value in having uh, anti-pro BMP levels for AFib patients. What do you think about that? Well, as, as I presented, um, anti-pro BMP um, is a good risk predictor, predictor even if in patients with atrial fibrillation, but um, the risk uh, starts um, to increase at quite high levels of anti-pro BMP. Um, so, it is a risk predictor also in atrial fibrillation, but at the later, at the higher level of anti-pro BMP. Um, the actual problem is this mixing with patients without atrial fibrillation. Um, it, it becomes even more complex if you make anti-pro BMP an endpoint, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, in studies um, which um, want to evaluate recompensation and they want to evaluate a delta of anti-pro BMP. Here, we don't really know whether you can apply the same delta of anti-pro BMP under recompensation in patients with atrial fibrillation and without. Um, but all of this is learning, right? So maybe at the end of the day, we will, we will um, have the answer to these questions. But right now, I have to say that anti-pro BMP is the best marker right now we have, but it's not an ideal one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to, to and best regards to, to Göttingen. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, see you joining in in the, in the discussions after uh, Sven's talk, which um, I'm looking forward to. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Bye. Hi, Sven. Oh, hi, everybody. Hi. How um, are you doing good. in Mainz? Well, pretty good, actually. How are you? Well, thanks for having us, and thanks for organizing the whole thing. And, um, well, nice working. Um, actually, my topic was highlights and imaging. Um, as there were no civil imaging studies, I decided to have a look at two imaging related studies. And um, one study is based on ischemia data from the ischemia trial, and they analyze the relationship of ischemia severity and coronary artery disease, extend with clinical outcomes. And um, they actually use, as I said, data from the ischemia trial, which was published last year. And that's the slide from 29 presentation where they uh, chose a, a composite endpoint consisting of cardiovascular death, MI hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, and resuscitated cardiac arrest as an endpoint. And as you can see, the trial basically taught us that an intervention is not necessarily associated with a better out outcome, as you can see here with the you p value. Have you, started your pre have you started your presentation already? Yeah, I tried to. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I'm just uh, seeing the um, the PowerPoint setup. Okay. And now? Still the same. Take a tap. Check. Ah, okay. Now that's what that's now it's working. Perfect. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, great. Uh, sorry about that. Um, now, okay. Um, that's a slide I should move on to. Um, basically, the ischemia outcome to outcome endpoints was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, and resuscitated cardiac arrest. And it told us that intervention is not necessarily associated with better outcome after a, a median follow-up of 3.2 years. And the data presented on Sunday is based on the ischemia trial. And in this ischemia trial included patients that, which were stable and had moderate or severe ischemia who received coronary CT, which was analyzed by CoLab, and finally the patients were randomized into an invasive strategy group and a conservative strategy group 
only receiving medical, optical medical treatment, while the invasive group also received cast and revascularization. In this study, the ischemia was categorized into mild, moderate, and severe based on different kinds of stress testing. And the anatomic severity of coronary artery disease was um, categorized according to a Duke prognostic index, which um, actually correlate high index is associated with most severe coronary artery disease. And what I found rather interesting is that ischemia was not associated at all, or the severity of ischemia was not associated at all with uh, all cause mortality, while the severity of coronary artery disease was. And when having a look at the specific endpoint, namely MI, and the degree of, uh, of ischemia showed a trend, whereas the Duke prognostic index showed a strong association, association with outcome. Now, the really interesting part is when having a closer look at ischemia and ischemia severity um, so associated with primary outcome. As you can see here, the blue lines represent the conservative treatment group, while the red ones, the invasive strategy group. The shading indicates like half width of confidence interval, that means where the shade hits the line, there's not a no significant difference. And as you can see, for severe, moderate and mild ischemia, there was no statistically significant index um, between treatment groups that held also true for myocardial infarction and all-cause mortality. When having a closer look at the anatomic severity, um, actually results were kind of the same. Um, the higher, the, the, the more severe the coronary artery disease was, the higher the incidence was. So mortality uh, was higher with increasing um, severity of coronary artery disease, disease. But again, there was no difference in treatment group between the invasive and the conservative strategy, which hold true for all stages of um, coronary artery disease. And again, this observation was also made for myocardial infarction and all cause mortality. So um, the problem with the study is that the follow-up was only up to now 3.2 years, and the coronary uh, CT was the only diagnostic to diagnose coronary artery disease and invasive yeah, angiography was not used. And patients with severe ischemia were not likely to be enrolled because they received CAF no matter what. And patients with left main disease and low ejection fraction were excluded. Therefore, um, the take home message of that study basically is that anatomy was more predictive of outcomes than ischemia itself, and that the ischemia main trial results apply to all ischemia and anatomic subgroups. And this is holds true, even though severe coronary artery disease was associated with an increased risk of death in an eye. And even in those cases, an invasive approach did not lower the risk of outcome. Now, the second study I'd like to talk about is a actually ancillary study to the ischemia trial uh, called the Chow study. Um, the Chow study examines individuals with non-ischemia and non-obstructive coronary artery disease and tried to uh, find a relation in those uh, between symptoms and um, the degree of the severity of ischemia. Um, ischemia with no obstructive coronary artery disease is also called ENOCA and is defined as having signs or symptoms of ischemic heart disease without having obstructive coronary artery disease, which affects about three to four million um, individuals. Mechanisms of this disease are not fully understood, but include the reduction of coronary flow reserves and epicardial or also microvascular coronary spasm. Nevertheless, it is associated with an increased risk of death, MI, heart failure, and stroke. And interestingly, healthcare cause of Inoka is similar to coronary artery disease patients. Now, um, the aim of that study was to investigate changes in symptoms and stress testing in INOCA patients over one year, since we only have expert recommendations um, on uh, symptom management. So no real trials are available 
for this um, specific topic. Now, the, as I said, it's an ancillary trial to the ischemia study. Um, in fact, those patients who were not eligible for the for inclusion to the ischemia trial and had no obstructive coronary artery disease were screening failure of ischemia, but were included into the child ischemia trial, which in which they assessed angina and repeated a stress echo after one year. Um, they graded angina according to the SAC, the Seattle Angina Questionnaire, which assesses activity, angina frequency, and other parts like quality of life. Um, an interesting observation was that Anoka patients were younger than coronary artery disease the patients, and 66% of Anoka patients were female, while this only holds true for 26% of the coronary artery patients. Another interesting observation is that Inoka patients were more frequently depressed in contrast to coronary artery disease patients. Coronary artery disease patients, however, had um, more often diabetes or were smoking, smoking more often than Inoka patients. The indication for stress testing for those Inoka patients was mainly 20, in 71%. That is with a typical angina, and some of them also had shortness of breath. And, um, the ischemia severity, according to ischemic segments, is shown in those two figures, um, did not differ between groups for stress echo. So the symptom severity, according to the SAC-7, was, um, the, was like they have to know that SAC-7, the higher 100% is like no symptoms and zero is extreme symptoms. So CHD patients were more symptomatic than Inoka patients, while Inoka patients had a higher frequency of angina in contrast to CHD patients. Like monthly angina was present in 47% of the Inoka patients, but only in 34% of the CHD patients. And weekly angina was in Inoka patients nearly three times more common or four times more common than in CHD patients. Interestingly, however, the frequency of angina did not correlate to the ischemia um, so and here you see the SAC AF angina frequency, and that's the ischemia. And as you can see, severe ischemia was present in roughly the same amount of patients having daily and weekly and scurrent angina as compared to monthly. And the same observation was made for coronary artery disease patients. And after one year, and that's the interesting part, if the uh, uh, stress echo normalized in 50% of the patients, while only in 45% it was worsened or unchanged. And finally, no correlation was found between one-year changes in ischemia and angina. So here you see the change in number of ischemic segments in uh, contrast to angina, angina frequency, and there was no relation present, and same held true for the SAC-7 final score there was also no relation. And they also did a subgroup analysis for those having reached a maximum predicted heart rate, having ST depression, and neither of those groups of relation was detected. Now, what were the predictors of uh, a normal stress echo after one year? And to put it into a nutshell, only calcium antagonists showed a positive association. However, you can see the confidence, confidence intervals are really large, and therefore, for this specific questions the study might have been uh, underpowered. Now, the take home message of the study is, in my point of view, that Inoka patients were more likely to be female. They have largely the similar severity of ischemia on stress echo to CHD patients. And they, even though they have more frequent angina, they had a better overall quality of life. Now, 50% of the Inoka patient had normal stress echo after one year. So it is likely that the remaining 45 or 50 patients, 50% 50 of the patients have microvascular dysfunction with possible adverse prognosis. And uh, finally, the angina frequency improved by 39% of Inoka patients um, despite little change in anti angina medication. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Sven, what was what was the most striking fact uh, while you were uh, you know re uh, reassessing the the ischemia trial for you? Was you know was there a new new site you know something you know you haven't paid attention to before? Well, Because actually, we see that it's very hard. Uh, our clinical experience is very different from uh, what the data shows. Correct. Yeah, definitely. Well, usually when in our, in our clinic, when we only we often do CAT depending on symptoms. So um, actually, I did not. I was not aware that is uh, severe ischemia is not uh, well, is not cured or is not associated with a better outcome uh, if you do a conservative treatment um, when compared to an invasive strategy. So I think that's rather new. And uh, well. I, well, I'm, I'm really interested in how the follow-up will be in like five years or six years, whether that gap is going to increase or if this uh, stays insignificant. It's, I don't know. Maybe it will change how we do CAT in the uh, in cardiology. And I think, uh, what do you think, you know, what, what we do not, you know, what we don't, uh, don't do, you showed that 20% um, of those with uh, Inoka uh, suffer from depression. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what we do also know that um, pain, the construct of pain is also associated to physical illnesses, uh, psycho, um, uh, psycho, psychic illnesses, and um, therefore depression might also be associated with pain. So whether the pain in an OCA patient is directly associated with ischemia or microvascular injury, is not really clear. It might even be associated with depression or other psychiatrist uh, illnesses. So I think that's also something we'll have to look into. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. And is there any question from the colleagues who are uh, on the board here? I believe that's not the case so we would move on to the next talk thank you very much sir. thank you and um i'm looking forward to to be a talk um i think which is a highlight within the highlights how to be hi javid uh, thank you for having me um i hope you can hear me um seems i'm the only one not at the hospital right now Uh, that's mostly because I'm actually on paternity leave. So staying at home with my child. Thank you for joining us. Um, although you, uh, obviously you have uh, a lot of more important things to do. Thank you very much. Yes, and it's always a pleasure, especially it's really nice to see all of um, the DZHK people in here. Um, it's a real pleasure. Um, as some of you might know, my focus of work has shifted a little bit. Um, from clinical trials and heart failure to interventional cardiology. And now I'm just trying to um, share my screen. Um, and this should be this year. Okay. Um. Okay, Javid, am I doing okay with the screen? Perfect. Okay. Good. So I'm depicting here a picture of the new University Heart Center we're trying to build in Berlin. I think it will be postponed by a decade or so with the recent events. Um, and I'm really grateful uh, that um, um, I was invited to talk about um, a virtual Congress, virtually meeting all of you guys. Um, and I chose to go into two trials um, in the field of heart failure. Um, two trials that will be discussed in the future intensively, I, I guess. Um, and it's possible that these um, trials will have significant impact onto the way that we treat heart failure patients today. Uh, the first trial is the Victoria trial. It was um, conducted by the Duke Clinical Research um, Institute and the Vigor Research Group, uh, funded by Merck USA and uh, Bayer on Biritziguat in patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. Um, this trial has one of the uh, co-authors or 
lead authors is actually my boss, Birkert Pieske. National lead in this trial for Germany was Frank Edelmann, who was also my boss for a while. And it happens that both Javid and I acted as investigators on this trial, um, bringing this compound to patients within the trial. So we actually have some hands-on experience with this. Bariciguard increases uh, the soluble granite circulase activity uh, to improve myocardial and vascular function. Um, this decreased NO activity and decreased soluble guanidate cyclase activity is one of the hallmarks of heart failure, mostly caused by oxidative stress, endothelial dysfunction, and it brings a problem in the heart and in the vasculature with itself. So the idea that was already um, under investigation in two phase two trials, Socrates and Socrates preserved, hopes to address um, the SGC problem with Virisiguat. This trial included chronic heart failure patients in New York Heart Association classes two to four with an LVAF below the threshold of 45 on guideline-based heart failure therapies. The trial started, I think, three, four years ago, uh, three, nearly uh, three years ago, um, and it included patients who were on a guideline recommended therapy at that time. Uh, this was the advent of um, Valsatan Sacobitril. We'll look into how many patients really were on these kind of medications um, within the trial. And this was even before the SGLT uh, therapy um, options that we currently have were introduced to our patients. These chronic heart failure patients were included after a worsening event. It means a recent heart failure hospitalization or intravenous diuretic use with elevated levels of BNP. Miroslava has addressed um, the question of NT pro BNP and myomarkers and designs for clinical trials previously. And the patients were required to be stable. After a 30 day screening period, they were able to um, run into the trial. Um, the trial design itself um, shot at including about 5,000 patients. Around 7,000 patients had to be screened to actually enter the trial. Nearly 2,000 were excluded because they did not meet the eligibility criteria. And then they were resigned in, uh, um, assigned in a one-to-one -one fashion. 2,500 actually received um, the Verum, Viriziguat, and 2,500 received the placebo. These were the baseline characteristics of interest. Once again, nearly three quarters of the patients were male, um, comparable about both groups. Um, there is a good spread of patients across the world, which I think in these times is especially of interest that these kind of trials actually work internationally and that international cooperation is, is really important for um, us to face and address these problems. Um, the patients had a fair amount um, in the previous three to six months uh, hospitalization uh, for heart failure or need for intravenous diuretics. This was the smallest group with 15%. And uh, other than that, the patients are pretty much the patients that we see in our emergency departments or in our outpatient clinics or the really sick patients with a severely impaired left ventricular ejection fraction, with elevated levels of NT pro BNP, with signs of congestion, patients who have already been hospitalized for heart failure. Um, and these are really pa uh, patients that need better care, I think. Um, and I addressed this in my introduction or tried it a little bit already to really ask myself what is guideline recommended therapy? So in the supplement of this um, um, work that has currently been published in the New England Journal of Medicine by uh, the lead authors, we see that 75% of the patients either received an ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. 93% were on beta blockers. Uh, there was a 70% rate of people on mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, which is what we actually expect to see in patients. And already 15% of patients have been on Sacopitria uh, valsatan or an angiotensin receptor neprolysin inhibitor treatment, which um, was at the time uh, where the study started actually quite new. These patients that were included underwent randomization and then were uptitrated with Zuat. 
on background of standard heart failure therapy, which means that they came to the um, our department or the, the respective um, study centers every two weeks to reach um, the target dose of 10 milligrams per day. If they did not reach this target dose, they were challenged to reach this target dose um, whenever they visited after this run-in period for titration. The study itself was event-driven. That means we looked for a time to event in this trial. Um, and I'd like to give you the results here. These are the results, as I mentioned earlier. The study was powered to meet a primary endpoint. The primary endpoint was in this case met. It was cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations. I think graphically one sees that nearly after four months after randomizations, both of these uh, functions seem to separate. We have the red and the blue. The um, virulent group actually seems to benefit. And of course, this is statistically significant. Um, we do not necessarily these, uh, see this kind of significance in the group um, of analysis that addresses cardiovascular causes alone. Hospitalizations for heart failure, um, we see is quite relevant. And death from any cause or hospitalization for heart failure, we see here there is a threshold of 0.9. If we look into the outcome table itself, we see that the combined endpoint remains positive. And it's especially um, the heart failure hospitalizations that act as a driver here in the endpoint. It's not so much the cardiovascular death that was affected, but ultimately what these data I think clearly show is that the hospitalizations for heart failure and the number of the total hospitalizations of heart failure are significantly affected. And it seems that this may be one of the first treatments that actually can reduce the number of heart failure hospitalizations, which is quite new and an, an exciting finding for everybody in the field. Um, in subgroup analysis, looking at patients who actually had a, an event in the Verisiguat or the placebo group, um, I think there is a, a, a really um, um, interesting point to be seen that it's quite heterogeneous, for example, in the group of younger age versus older age. Um, it seems that this effect can be more clearly pronounced in, in the younger age group. Um, and there is a second interesting point I'd like to address here, that it seems that the patients who were not on sacopitrilazatan seem to benefit a little bit more from the therapy than um, patients who were actually on this treatment already. Um, especially the patients with lower ejection fractions um, showed a benefit. And there's also a lot of heterogeneity here in the NT, pro, BNP level groups. It seems that patients with the baseline characteristics in the fourth quartile of NT, pro, BNP did not necessarily benefit so much in regards to um, the hazard ratio. Looking at blood pressure, blood pressure as this uh, compound also is considered to affect the vasculature, blood pressure and syncope were of interest as um, adverse safety um, measures. And we see that after two, four, 16 and 32 weeks, there was no statistically significant difference between the change from, for the change in baseline between the virum and the placebo group, um, which is of clear relevance to patients, especially when you have a patient, a typical heart failure patient in which you cannot uptitrate. Um, the upper therapies, uh, maybe due to systolic blood pressure. So one might ask the question, how does this approach compare to recent developments in the field? Um, it is an interesting point because it's always a question, what incremental value does this new therapeutic option add to the existing therapy that we have in place already? And the um, very cigarette author group also tried to address this um, with a new paper looking at paradigm for the Balsatan Sarcopetri group, DAPA, HF for DAPA glyphosine, and Victoria itself. Um, because one of the most interesting things is that the very cigarette Victoria trial was stopped after a medium follow up of about 11 months. Um, looking at Paradigm, which was stopped after 28 months, um, there's quite a difference in the, in the time that the patients were actually in the trial. 
So they, uh, the authors here, uh, Travel Butler and others, tried to, to look at this by making a, a, a timely match of the outcomes that the patient had and try to compare that. And it's actually, it's really hard to, to come up with this kind of comparison for novel treatments across trials, because there are several factors that can confound this comparison, like baseline characteristics and the running periods, um, inclusion, exclusion criteria, uh, background therapy, and even the international scope of these trials. Um, and addressing hazard ratios um, might not be the ideal way of, of doing this. Um, so they tried to look at the absolute risk reduction in cardiovascular death and in at absolute risk reduction in first heart failure hospitalizations um, to squeeze these three trials more and more or less into one table and, and look how far they can compare the incremental value added, uh, added or the benefit that we see in these patients. So I find this a very interesting approach. The second analysis is from uh, Piotr Ponikowski uh, from Poland addressing DAPA HF. Um, one can see this DAPA analysis in the same discussion that I tried to bring up uh, when looking at the Victoria results. Because ultimately it's, it's um, the question what drives events and what role do recurrent events play in these kind of trials. Time to an event might be of interest, but what happens to patients that have multiple events that are hospitalized once or twice, three times, four times over the course of the trial. And this is a, not a prospective, but a predefined secondary analysis of DAPA-HF, looking at patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction who were in the DAPA-HF trial. Um, these patients are known to experience more than one hospitalization during the course of their disease. I mean, 15 million people around are suffering from heart failure in the European Union alone. These are, are the patients that most frequently come to the hospital in industrialized countries. We know that this is the most important by numbers um, um, admission diagnosis for the hospital. So it's, it's really um, interesting and conventional time to first event analysis ignores these kind of repeated hospitalizations in the patients. Um, so there was the idea that um, the use of a composite outcome does not reflect the full burden of heart failure, um, not the burden by a single hospitalization, but by multiple and recurrent hospitalizations. Once again, this was the DAPA HF design, which has, has been uh, presented previously. The patients were randomized to receive or not. Um, also, similarly, around 5,000 patients in this trial. I, I like to bring up the the point again that it might be not um, not so great if you need to 20,000 patients to prove your point uh, in a heart failure trial four five six thousand patients might be enough to um, if there is really uh, value added and and I think in the DAPA trial this was very comparable to to the Victoria trial. And it seems that um, the first heart failure rest, um, hospitalization and cardio de um, cardiovascular death um, comparing placebo to dapagliflozine also um, bring in a very interesting and highly statistically significant hazard ratio into this. Um, and what they really tried is um, also look at the um, recurrent event analysis, um, which means that what kind of absolute risk reduction per 100 patient years do you actually have? What number needed to treat are you looking at? And it's very interesting that if, for example, we're looking at heart failure hospitalization, um, the absolute risk reduction is 3.8 per 100 patient years. This means that the number needed is 27. Looking at a combined endpoint for a time to event analysis, um, this is the number needed to treat of 26 with heart failure hospitalizations of 35. And um, in comparison to Victoria, where this was 4.2 per 100 patient years and um, a number needed to treat of about 24, um, it seems that um, we're in the same field of trying to compare this um, um, kind of trials. Although 
the DAPA HF population is, I think, from my point of view, really a different population than this really high risk population that the Victoria investigators included in this trial. So um, one of the um, points that um, Piotr Ponikowski in this um, summary and conclusion brings up is that over a relatively short period of follow-up, 18.2 uh, months, a large number of patients experience recurrent heart failure hospitalizations. Um, these patients are more advanced and suffer from more comorbidities in their patient journey on uh, the disease of heart failure. But DAPA glifosin reduced the risk of both first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization. Um, the reduction in risk of recurrent heart failure ho hospitalizations with DAPA glifosin was more pronounced after accounting um, for these risks. Uh, so I think what a question is and remains is uh, what kind of therapy um, in this world do we want to put our patients on? Um, I think there has been Ivapradine introduced, there has been Vazatanzacobitril, there is the uh, SGLT inhibitors, there's the soluble gonalat cyclase, there's the device therapy, um, and it, it really remains a challenge. Um, what kind of personalized medicine, if you wish, um, or tailored medicine approach you take, look at what a situation your patient is in and um, what therapeutic option might fit best. Thank you so much. Javid, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, very good, now should be better. Good. Very good. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this uh, great talk. Um, what do you think about uh, this, uh, what they called in the, in the setting of worsening heart failure? So patients um, who were um, hospitalized before or needed IV, um, IV uh, drug therapy. What do you think, you know, about these uh, about this population? Do you think this is uh, a population which was neglected in the trials before, or is it something, you know, which is, uh, you know, how do what do you think about it? Um, so I, I think that um, there have been multiple approaches um, in the setting of clinical trials uh, to address the issue of recurrent heart failure hospitalizations in patients. Um, and most of um, the concepts that we were looking at are management questions. So there was the idea of telemedicine approaches uh, that seem to um, bring in some benefit in these patients. Um, nursing based systems where nurses go into the community, all kinds of management issues. But finding a compound or a concept that would really be able to reduce heart failure hospitalizations um, and have a drug for this is, is, I think, something that we could you really use uh, in the clinical setting. And um, my hope would be uh, that the compound finds a place in um, bringing this option to the table for our patients. I think it's an underestimated problem, especially in the sitting that in a tertiary academic care unit or a heart failure center, we see a lot of the patients. Um, and we also remember the patients that show up frequently, that come in and you know, deteriorate. If you look at the, the old Mikhail Georgiade curve, and we see, we see these frequent comers that just go home maybe for a few days or weeks, and then you meet them on the ward and they say, hi, doctor, I'm back. And, and there's um, insufficient options we have for these patients. And my hope would be that the compound or this concept behind it um, brings a new tool um, and a new physiological target to help here. Well, how do you explain that the group with the highest levels of anti-pro-BNP somehow behave very different from the um, other groups. 
I do not have a uh, good explanation for this. Um, maybe um, Miroslava, if, she, if she's still on, has an idea. Um, I, I would be happy to hear ideas of, of the other people on board. I think these are the patients that are probably sickest. Miroslava, can you jump in for me? Here, Tobias. Uh, thank you for an excellent talk. Uh, I'm not sure whether I got it correctly. Patients in the highest um, quartile um, of antiprob MP, they tended to um, had actually worse outcome with verosiguat. Did I? Did I get or at least, or at least, do not benefit or benefit at, you know, the least. Huh? Yes. Mm. So this is actually. I have another question, which, which is probably, uh, which somehow fits to the to the first question of you, David, and this is the mechanism of action of verosiguat. So, um, what doesn't make sense for me is that patients with uh, left ventricular ejection fraction below thirty five percent seem seem to benefit more with verosiguat, but patients with high antipro BMP not, and this is for me. A paradox, actually, because I would expect that patients with the lowest uh, ejection fraction would have the highest antipro BMP levels. Um, so exactly, I don't have any answer why um, patients with high antipro BMP uh, don't benefit so much. Maybe they um, actually reach a point of no return where you cannot stimulate the myocardium even more um, because then you get actually a paradox answer, if you know what I mean. Maybe. What do you think? Um, so first, I think this that we have identified an interesting point uh, that we will, I think, be to, to discuss uh, also with people outside of this. And second, I think um, that anti-pro BNP is a very good marker of congestion uh, with the left atrial pressures or the atrial pressures and the uh, venous overload uh, and the sign for um, maybe even a surrogate for edema, pulmonary congestion, um, and all that, you know, in the cascade comes beyond this. And I think that LVEF, ejection fraction, and NT-pro-BNP, um, they have a, there, there is, there is an overlap, but in the end, they look at different, um, at different levels of the heart. And I think that this might be a, a, a of interest. Personally, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of of going with the LVF to one point. I think you know, in clinical practice, what you want to know is also is the patient in what quartile. If you want to compare it with NT pro BNP of deterioration with the LVF, is, is this? But it seems maybe that there's also more reserve in the myocardium. Um, that um, what what I'm asking is whether there is a problem with verosiguat with relaxation. If you stimulate the contraction, is there maybe a problem with the relaxation of the myocardium? Because this might actually lead to even worse antipro, this might worsen antipro BMP levels. But I, I don't know the, the exact mechanism of the drug. Um, so it, it should actually help relaxation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what, what the role of the um, uh, soluble guanazacas and the NO actually uh, would help. Um, but really, I think um, we, I would need a pathophysiologist or somebody with a, a deeper molecular insight into the compound. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I would maybe end with my last one because, you know, um, looking at the data, uh, we saw a discrepancy between the endpoints. So, um, the primary endpoint was reached, but uh, with cardiovascular death, for example, and other endpoints, you know, this is, uh, we couldn't see the great effect of uh, Verisigward, um, not, not the effect we hope for. How do, how do you interpret this? So I think this is a question of trial design. Um, if you design a trial, um, you look at an event rate um, that you expect in this group of patients. Uh, the event rate that you would typically expect is 12-14%. Um, um, 
actually they they um, I think they um, used eleven percent event rate and um, in fact the event rate was a lot higher um, an indicator for um, a high risk uh, population and what you really want to do with the trial is you want to meet the endpoint or fail with the endpoint uh, so if you see for example an effect in um, all cause mortality which we did not see in this trial this would be an indicator from my point of view that you overpowered the trial um, so um, i think the um, everybody um, on the trial did a really good job in designing a trial that addressed uh, the question of the trial to meet the endpoint and yes the endpoint was met um, the secondary and our exploratory um, and did not maybe deliver the signal there. But it's all also, I think, a, a great signal that the main driver of the endpoint is hospitalization. Thank you very much for walking us through this very, very interesting study. Thank you, Javid. Keep it up. Thank you, Tobias. And um, now I'm welcoming um, Elham Kevampur from Heidelberg. Hello. Hi, Javid. Thank you for organizing all this. I really appreciate. Thank you, um, um, Intello, to everyone out there. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. And um, now I try to um, share my monitor. Let's see how it works. So that's it. So do you have the slides? Perfect, yeah. All right. OK. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, studies on cardiomyopathies, which was um, addressed and presented in ACC 2020. Uh, there were not so many such studies on cardiomyopathies. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the most eye-catching one, which is the Maverick HCM study from Mycardia. Mycardia is the um, company producing the Maverick Hampton and has already uh, investigated in, in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in pioneer HCM and explore HCM trials. And the investigators are now um, uh, investigated that medication in um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and then they wanted to see if it could also help patients with hypertrophic non-obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is about one third of all HCM patients. And uh, the disadvantage of these patients actually is that they cannot um, have any benefit from invasive therapy. They could not have any TASH or cannot benefit from operation. Um, so the only thing that they have is currently the medication with beta blocker and calcium channel uh, blockers, as well as diuretics and other symptomatic therapies. Um, and end stage ACM patients would need a myocardial uh, a cardiac um, transplantation. So, um, if you have a look at the pattern mechanisms of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you will see that um, the myosin acting cross bridges are more than enough actually in these patients, which leads to a hypercontractibility. It, uh, patients have a higher than normal LV ejection fraction. They have a diastolic dysfunction, they impair the relaxation, and they also have an altered myocardial energetics. So, um, Mavacampton is a, a first-in-class selective cardiac myosin inhibitor, which reduces the number of myosin acting cross bridges. And with that, the investigator hoped to also help the hypertrophic non-obstructive cardiomyopathy. With the hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, they could um, already show their safety and tolerability of that medication and started ongoing um, trials on that. So the Maverick study design was including um, patients in a phase two study, a double blind placebo control study, uh, treating patients with Maverick Hampton or placebo over 16 weeks, followed by a washout phase of eight weeks. The patients were randomized into three um, groups, group one and two with a different dosage of Maverick Hampton. Uh, which was tested uh, using the pharmacokinetics of the, uh, the plasma drug concentration, actually, and the placebo group um, was also there. So about 19 to 20 patients in each group. All of these patients received 5 milligrams mavacampton at baseline, and they got the treatment over 16 weeks. At, six, uh, at week six, the dose was adjusted. It was not adjusted based on the ejection fraction or clinical symptoms of the patients, 
it was adjusted only using a PK, um, they uh, adjusted it to the plasma drug concentration. Um, all of these patients had normal or higher than normal ejection fraction, all of them had an NT proven P of higher than 300, and um, none of them had an obstruction, uh, so they all have a maximum gradient of less than 30. There were some stopping criteria, the LV ejection fraction reduction to 45% or less than that would be a stopping criteria. Uh, five of the patients reached, reached this stopping criteria actually. Um, the very high plasma drug concentration would be another um, stopping criteria and the prolongation of the QT on ECG would be the other one. So. Um, as I said, that was a phase two study uh, looking for safety and tolerability of that drug. So the key safety endpoint was the frequency and severity of treatment imagined adverse events or adverse events of special interest and serious adverse events. Uh, the authors also, the investigators also looked at some exploratory efficacy objective, for example, changes in cardiac uh, biomarkers such as cardiac troponin e, uh, I or nt P, maximum oxygen uptake, changes in New York Heart Association function class, changes in um, the left ventricular injection fraction echocardiography, and they also used a composite functional endpoint which you used in uh, their previous studies that was a um, composite of changes in um, peak oxygen uptake and changes in New York Heart um, functional class. So I have a look at the baseline characteristics. As you see, the patients were symptomatic, but um, not very symptomatic. So most of them were in the New York Heart classification class two. Um, they all had a high nt proven p level, so the mean was around 700 to 900, and uh, about 60% of the patients were already on beta blocker, and about 15 to 25% of them were already on calcium channel blockers. Um, if you now have a look at the baseline echo parameters, um, all the patients had a normal or higher than normal um, <clears throat> left ventricular injection fraction with a mean of about 70% and none of them had the gradient or the LV outflow tract. So um, let's have a look at the endpoint, the adverse events during treatment and the washout phase. Um, around 90% of the patients receiving the Malacampton showed one or more treatment imagined adverse events. About 76% of them were only mild ones, such as dizziness, uh, fatigue. And interestingly, around 70% of patients on placebo showed also treatment imagined adverse events. Um, the investigators think that they are not really not um, uh, obviously uh, associated to the drug, but could also be uh, part of the disease because many patients with HCM have the days with fatigue or with dizziness and so on. Um, very interesting is that the placebo group showed more often serious adverse events, so um, twice as high as the Mamacampton group, as you see, uh, about 20%. Most of the serious adverse events were actually atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, which also the investigators believe that might be a part of the disease. As we know, around 35 to 40% of patients with HCM have some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation at some time. Um, so um, um, the most feared um, complication or side effect of the Mabacampton um, is the reduction of the LV ejection fraction. The uh, investigator believes it's actually a part of the uh, working mechanism of the disease and do not call this a real uh, adverse event. Um, here you see that the changes, the, just, the changes in the ejection fraction between the Malacampton and placebo group is not significantly different. So it is around 4% in Mabacampton, the poor Mabacampton group and around 22% in placebo group. Um, as a clinical uh, cardiologist, you know, that a 4% changes in ejection fraction might also be an inter-observer variability. So um, it is, um, and the other point is that um, the uh, investigators um, think that it is because they did not use ejection fraction to adjust the dose, uh, which they will do in the future trials. So they think it won't happen uh, that often in the uh, further trials uh, if they use the ejection fraction changes as a parameter to adjust the dose uh, for the patients.
Um, here I plotted the five patients which had to stop the medication because they reduced the ejection fraction to 45% or less. Um, uh, it was around uh, week 11 to 13, and so the medication was stopped for all these five patients. Um, three of them had no symptoms of a heart failure uh, and was only stopped because of this uh, stopping criteria. One of them had uh, some mild symptoms of heart failure and, became, and, and got a diuretics and was not hospitalized. And one of the patients had to be hospitalized because he had um, um, uh, symptoms of heart failure, but he also had, um, or she also had um, um, atrial fibrillation episode and was known to have some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So the investigators again believe that it was because of the atrial fibrillation um, that the ejection fraction reduced, mostly because the ejection fraction only started to get normal as they are after they ablated the atrial fibrillation. So, uh, and as you see at the um, week 24 or 25, after having stopped with the medication, the ejection fraction um, improved actually to normal or again, higher values. Um, so um, let's have a look at the exploratory efficacy results. The uh, investigators looked for reduction of cardiac biomarkers and CPROBMP as a marker of cardiac stress and also cardiac troponin I as a biomarker of myocardial injury. As you see, uh, antiprobin P starts very quickly all around the week four already to decrease significantly between the mavacamptin and the placebo group and um, only um, goes high again after discontinuation of the drug in the washout phase and the cardiac troponin I um, starts uh, decreasing at around week 10 to 12 and also goes high again after the uh, discontinuation of the drug. Um, so the investigators hope that in the following um, studies, they could see some real effect of changes in cardiac biomarkers uh, during the therapy. And they could also um, use these parameters to um, see whether the medication is working or not, or how to uh, adjust the dose um, based on these parameters. Let's have a look at the exploratory functional composite endpoint. Uh, well, on the left side of the monitor, you see that the intention to treat the 40 patients of the Malacanthin um, compared to the 19 of the placebo, um, they did not um, defer in um, reaching the functional composite endpoint. Actually, it's a good point to discuss after what maybe that the 21% of uh, the patients in the placebo also reached the functional composite endpoint. Um, so the authors um, um, performed some more analysis and saw uh, in a group of combined subgroup and combined patients uh, with 21 patients in the um, Mavacaptain group and 12 in the placebo, uh, the uh, difference between the two groups was uh, significant and only the patients with Mavacaptain reached a functional composite endpoint. Um, who were these patients? They were all patients with um, either cardiac troponin I, uh, which was abnormal at baseline, or those with uh, significant diastolic dysfunction with an E over E prime average of 14, of higher than 14. So we know that about 30% of patients with HCM have an abnormal high cardiac troponin I, and around 40% of patients with HCM have a significant diastolic dysfunction. So this might be the group that will benefit the more from the most from the therapy, actually. Um, so let's conclude. The investigators think that the, the MAVA is generally well tolerated by the most participants in this uh, trial. They could observe no excess of serious adverse events. Um, the reduction of LV ejection fraction was possible, and in this trial, it was reversible in all cases. And um, so um, they would use this to uh, further adjust the dose and further studies. Um, they could see um, a reduction of um, cardiac biomarkers and would um, hope to see that in further studies which have the power to, ass to assess this um, endpoint also. And it seems that patients with more severe disease uh, benefit the most from other. Um, that's it with this. I uh, thank you for watching and um, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. For this very great talk, I think it's a it's a drug um, which we will see in a in a phase uh, three trial very soon. Mm -hmm.
That sounds. Um, what do you think? You know, what what uh, patient population would you uh, target for a phase three trial based on this trial? Well, I think it would help a lot if we take this high um, risk patients with a higher values of cardiac troponin I at baseline and um, diastolic dysfunction that was shown to uh, be the group that benefit the most. Um, um, I'm really curious to see the, the investigator strategy, actually. We see the um, effect on antiprobium reduction. Um, do you think that anti-pro-BMP uh, is a tool to, you know, for risk stratification for the for the population to come? I do not. I didn't understand the question. So, in the phase in the phase three trial, would we target? You said that you know we should target for um, high levels of troponin, but uh, should we you know uh, you know watch uh, on anti-pro-BMP levels too on high levels of that, or what do you think about it in this population? Mm -hmm. it, it could be. It was uh, actually it was shown in this investigation that it, um, the combined subgroup, uh, which reached the endpoint significantly, they all had very high level of anti P. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be actually also a very good parameter to choose for the best patients. Um, for example, in that group, the placebo did not have higher levels of, they also had higher levels of nt p but taking the placebo, it did not help. So I also believe that nt p would be a valuable parameter for that too. Hmm. And what do you think is, uh, so the placebo, uh, what, is, what, is, what should be the best placebo for, for, for a trial like this? You know, I think this is very, this is a very novel technique and we have to think about you know, the right placebo to measure with. Um, yeah, I don't know. The placebo is um, currently a um, drug also that patients take. And, um, well, I'm not really into the strategy of the investigator, what placebo they take, <laughs> but um, don't right. can't really answer that question. <laughs> okay. And uh, what do you think, you know, what is, uh, you know, regarding this, this population, um, the... We have to consider in you know, a phase three trial with more patients. We have to think about the con medication they take, and um, the standard of care varies uh, very, very much um, among among this population. What you know? How do you? you know, what is what is the greatest um, the Time. factor? You, yeah, challenge you see there. Um, well, um, our center has um, um, helped with the, or has participated in the Explore HCM trial with Mavacampton. And um, what, what I think is a challenge um, for such um, companies or for, for such drug producers who plan such studies is um, that they have many participating centers, each um, enrolling a few patients. So I think this makes it really heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So they should really have very good SOPs to show um, you know, how to select the patients, how to, and this has also been the case, I mean, in the case of the trial that we participated in, I can't um, judge on the other trials, but I think this is very important to, um, to standardize all the steps. And I, I think it's important to let the patients on their standard of care. I won't stop them from taking their own medication. That might be the next, um, steps or something, but I think uh, at the beginning we would need to have stable patients who have their better blocker. If they had, if they brought it with, I would. I won't stop that. All right. Thank you very much, Aha. You're welcome. And um, if there are no other questions from our group, which I don't see, I thank you very much and uh, best regards to hard work. And now. I'm, as I said in the very beginning, I'm looking forward to our um, special speaker, uh, David Duncan from Hanover. Uh, thank you for being with us today and uh, presenting the results in electrophysiology. Yeah, thank you very much, Javid. Um, dear colleagues, thanks for inviting me to talk here. This is a really nice meeting. Um, and congratulations, uh, Javid, to organize such a contemporary and exciting meeting in these unprecedented times.
Um, I appreciate it. Uh, really, the, um, it's an exceptional effort uh, enabling scientific exchange and uh, networking, etc. Um, and however, I have to. I, I volunteered to participate today, but then I uh, checked uh, all the late breakers of ACC, and I have to admit, ACC is probably not the Congress for electoral physiologists, right? This might be due to the fact that we were about to have the ERA Congress to take place in Vienna this weekend simultaneously. And um, I suppose there, there's where the late breakers uh, went. However, I want to, I, I scanned um, the over 400 abstracts on Arrhythmia NDP and I chose just two abstracts that catched my eye. The first one, um, uh, because of uh, the innovative idea, I think, and the really nice presentation. And I'll show you some of uh, the videos of the presenter, really nice. And uh, the second one, because it just treats an everyday question we might uh, get on the ward or working on in the emergency room, um, just a quick, quick abstract. Um, just uh, to let you uh, know what the late breakers were, that's the list, and I really didn't find any EP study here. So that's really, um, uh, yeah, I, I think it's due to the fact that uh, we all were about to start to Vienna. However, let me show you one um, nice abstract from Dr. Martin van Zul from Mayo Clinic uh, called the Complete Four Chamber Resynchronization, a novel percutaneous epicardial pacing lead. And it's really nice. I will show you uh, how they, they did it. The background is that uh, transvenous devices bear several risks we all are aware of uh, in uh, everyday clinical practice like lead failure or lead related infections. Uh, if you get a pocket infection, you have a direct contact to the bloodstream leading to maybe endocarditis. You, if you have to extract the leads, you have extraction complications. Uh, if you place the lead via the tricuspid valve, you can get a relevant tricuspid regurgitation, etc. And um, we also know that uh, the more leads we implant, the more we uh, have to deal with any complications. So uh, we, we are searching for alternatives um, and the global trend is towards uh, more and more extravascular devices and less invasive devices. On the other hand, biventricular pacing is a well-established um, and a guideline directed therapy for heart failure um, for cardiac re ventricular um, resynchronization. And on the other hand, uh, a biatrial pacing has some proposed, let's say, uh, benefits. There are some studies uh, showing some benefit of a biatrial pacing or left even left atrial pacing, uh, reducing. Uh, either AF episodes in heart failure patients or uh, improving heart failure symptoms. This data is really weak, but it's an option for, um, for additional uh, stimulation purposes. So the idea, the, uh, the group in Mayo Clinic uh, uh, pursued was they wanted to try a four chamber physiological pacing, re resynchronizing the atrium and the ventricle um, by a minimally invasive percutaneous procedure, avoiding any transvenous approach and leaving minimal exogenous material implanted. And the hypothesis was that they would implant the pacing device uh, if, uh, via an epicardial approach using the transverse pericardial sinus, not very uh, used to that uh, location as a cardiologist, but it's, I'll, I'll show you, and uh, enabling a four-chamber pacing. Um, 
and they the aim was to develop a novel prototype device and they used 12 acute canine experimental models uh, to show that it works so the transverse pericardial sinus is the sinus between um, you see it here uh, indicated be between the outflow tracts so you see the aorta and um, the pulmonary artery and the uh, superior vena cava and that's the sinus um, called the transverse pericardial sinus that's where they placed the lead i will show you uh, immediately uh, the the system components were uh, a multipolar lead you see it here with um, uh, several bipoles uh, here, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, the tip of the, the tip of the uh, lead uh, was, uh, yeah, enabling that uh, the, it can be uh, uh, used with a snare just to uh, get the, sorry, to get the, the lead uh, in place and uh, there, there were, were four IS-1 pins uh, to be connected to a standard pacemaker device. So that's the video uh, showing you the approach. It's a standard epicardial approach. We are used to um, perform, uh, especially for uh, epicardial ablations. Uh, they used two incisions and then they place, you see it here, the um, sheath. Then the lead is advanced through the sinus here. And uh, then they use the snaring technique to um, pull the lead and advance the lead to the right ventricle. And then you have uh, two bipoles on the right ventricle, on the right atrium, on the left atrium, and on the left ventricle to enable uh, the four chamber pacing you see here. Really interesting approach. Um, you, you can see the fluoroscopy here uh, in the dogs advancing the lead with the, uh, uh, with the four bipoles. And here, the, that's the complete system connected to a standard device. And these are the signals uh, showing uh, you that uh, it's really an, a nice, like EGM. You can't call it intracardiac um, electrocardiogram, but uh, it's, it, it, it's exactly the same like uh, from standard pacemaker leads, right? You see the two bipoles um, on, on, the, on the atria and on the ventricles here. The parameters are nice and appropriate, I think. Uh, adequate thresholds, adequate amplitudes and imp impedances. So it's just like you, um, you see in standard pacemakers here. The biventricular pacing was uh, achieved in more than 80% and the biatrial pacing in 50%. Of course, that's a matter of spacing of the bipoles and um, where, where you really get to uh, stimulate the atria. Phrenic capture is an issue in a CRT. Here it was mitigated in all um, in, in all dogs that, that showed it um, because uh, they were able to reposition it easily during the implant procedure and they didn't see any acute complications during implant. So the, the authors conclude that in this acute but nicely performed canine experiments, a novel transverse sinus epicardial pacing device showed that it is safe and feasible, uh, that it is um, feasible with reasonable parameters for pacing and um, stimulating. And in most of the, um, in, in most of the experiments, the biventricular and biatrial capture was delivered. So that 
was just a new idea, innovative idea, I think. And I wanted to show you these nice videos, especially. So the next abstract I uh, just uh, wanted to show you briefly was the ICARTI study, a study from Italy um, addressing a uh, yeah, really everyday question. The aim was to show the safety and efficacy of a, an elect elective electric cardioversion without previous transesophageal echocardiography in outpatients with persistent AF lasting longer than 48, uh, 48 hour, hours and adequately treated with an anticoagulation. And in fact, it's what the guidelines uh, tell us. We, we can perform it, but uh, the guidelines uh, tell us this practice, how we do it, um, has never been evaluated in controlled trials. And um, I think it's nice to hear that um, um, the Italian group just uh, analyzed, it, analyzed it retrospectively for the single sender retrospective observational study with con consecutive patients from 2005 to 2017, patients with persistent AF with lasting longer than 48 hours and scheduled for elective cardioversion. And they all had a minimum of three weeks of effective anticoagulation, either vitamin K antagonists or non-vitamin K uh, antagonists. And uh, there was the safety endpoint, of course, um, with major adverse cardiac events, especially stroke and MI, and uh, an efficacy endpoint uh, with sinus rhythm restoration immediately after cardioversion. They included more than 1,200 outpatients, mainly uh, 67 years and mainly male. Only one patient out of this uh, 1,200 patients received an echo before cardioversion. And uh, the outcome was that after, well, or within 30 days, only one patient, which is 0.1% had an ischemic stroke. Another patient had an acute myocardial infarction, which is really low. And the cardioversion success rate was uh, 93 percent. However, um, of course, this has nothing to do with the echo or the anticoagulation. Um, here you see that, um, again, the, the outcome was, um, as I said, only one stroke. Um, no one died. No one died related to the cardioversion. And uh, if you see, if you look here, you see that um, the episodes of bleeding, which is of course also a safety endpoint, um, was 0.2%. So the authors here conclude that the Ecarté study demonstrates that the elective cardioversion can be safely performed without TOE in patients with persistent AF receiving appropriately treated uh, anticoagulation, um, which is already, I think, um, normal practice, but um, without really having the data to uh, underpin that. So thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to have your questions. Dear David, thank you very much. These were two amazing uh, studies, very interesting. Uh, one very promising, and the other one um, actually uh, bring us the uh, yeah, the proof for what is what is daily practice. Thank you very much. Um, I had uh, one question. You know, maybe I, I would uh, start with a with a second uh, with a second study. Is it really you know at our department we perform um, a TOE even when the patient is on on anticoagulation? This is not the case in your department, huh? Um, well. If the patient is um, on uh, oral anticoagulation for at least three or four weeks, uh, we 
skip the TOE. Um, and uh, we only perform it if um, they are, they are, they are, there are doubts or anything with the anticoagulation. Yeah, right. Yeah. And now in COVID times, uh, we all put them on anticoagulation first and would reschedule um, uh, the, the uh, cardioversion uh, in four weeks, let's say. I think especially your last point is very important uh, for daily practice now since we have to reduce our, our exposure. Um, but this is very interesting. Uh, this is very interesting because uh, somehow maybe that's Berlin and that's very different in Hanover that uh, maybe we doubt too much what, uh, whether the patients you know, are, show the right compliance and adherence to their, to their medication. Because yeah. it's, it's a very, it's a very um, difficult population to young patients with heart failure and atrial fibrillation um, they uh, have a lot of, you know, not a lot of them, but, you know, there are a significant amount of them have a, has a um, cognitive impairment. Um, so we have to, uh, we are, we try to be better safe than sorry, but uh, obviously the study shows that we are safe uh, even if we don't have the TOE. Yeah, but I fully agree. Um, if, if, if you are in doubt, uh, and of course, cognitive impairment can be a doubt. So uh, th then you, sh you should perform a TOE. That's my uh, impression. But if you are, I mean, we, we all have uh, the younger patient without impairments and mm -hmm. etc. They know very well when they uh, take or not take the, the medication. And then uh, if you're sure you, uh, you can perform it without TOE, I think. Yes. Uh, David, may, uh, David I, I, sorry if I may, if I'm interrupting here, I find uh, both of the of the abstracts that you presented really fascinating. Um, although I have no clue about uh, heart electric, as our electrophysiologists say, uh, I wanted to add though that I don't think that um, that there's the I'm at least not aware of a clinical trial that evaluated how safe the TOE itself is. I mean, we, we say that we perform the TOE, um, but it, it really depends also on the person performing the TOE. And, and I, I would think that the NOAC um, in, in some cases might be, might be even safer than, than, than a TOE. It depends a little bit yeah. also on... on um, yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're probably right. I think this is uh, something, yeah. Always, you know, think about the placebo group, and uh, you're totally right. Yeah, this is something um, I at least haven't thought about it, and I've never heard anyone else think about it. Um, cool. And uh, one question to, you know, regarding the first uh, the first um, study with epicardial leads. Um, so there's a lot of discussions going on, you know, since a few years ago um, regarding his bundle pacing. So this is. So this is the stuff um, which is, you know, is uh, there is a transitioning phase from the trials into clinical practice at the moment. And listening to your talk, I was, you know, maybe we skip his bundle pacing and uh, we, go to the, we go to the next level. Well, I think his bundle pacing is important and we will pursue that uh, in the future, and uh, we ha have to learn a lot, but um, we will implement it even more in our daily practice. However, um, we have uh, very strong evidence for standard cardiac risk synchronization therapy. So we should not leave that uh, with uh, go very good studies uh, and good effects uh, for, uh, leave it for just for his bundle pacing. We should uh, I, I think we should evaluate which patient um, we choose for CRT standard or his bundle pacing. Um, and well, I think the, the, the other, the, the, the canine study uh, now with epicardial leads, I don't know if, <laughs> if that is really the future, but it's interesting because it shows us uh, we still uh, have to learn about alternatives and it isn't an alternative However, I don't, do not fully agree with the authors that um, this is minimally invasive. Uh, putting two sheaths in, in the epicardium uh, 
is not minimally invasive. But however, we, we are very, we regularly, regularly perform it for VT ablation. We, are, we have a high experience with that. So we can use this knowledge to maybe uh, search for alternatives for pacing or anything else. So that's why it's so fascinating, I think. True. And uh, regarding four chamber pacing, would you think um, about, you know, for the right study to, um, to investigate this, would you think about a heart failure population where we're already trying to resynchronize the heart uh, and see that? that this population has a lot of other comorbidities? Mm -hmm. Or would you think about um, a group of patients who maybe needs only a one chamber um, uh, you know, pacemaker where we would try to prevent uh, pacemaker defects? Well, it's as always, if you start a therapy, you have to choose the patients where you have the greatest effects. Uh, and then you can downsize it uh, and uh, look for subgroups. I think it should be the, uh, the heart failure patients because a normal heart without uh, with normal ejection fraction, normal atrial ejection fraction, etc., uh, will not will, will compensate the, even if it's not synchronized um, on the atrial or ventricular level, uh, will compensate uh, the dyssynchrony. So we will not be able to measure uh, an uh, an effect. I think so. We sh we probably will start with the. Um, with the deteriorated patients uh, uh, and um, we will have to evaluate the effect in this population. Thank you very much. And I have not only to thank you, but uh, to thank the uh, young DGK um, uh, speakers too, especially Victoria, uh, who supported us uh, in this meeting very much. Thank you, David. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. Bye -bye. And I would love to invite. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, uh, Javid. Um, How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks. Um, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I just told the colleagues, you know, you were on the ICU ward, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, thanks. I'm very much looking forward to the valvular diseases talk. Thank you, Javid. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and thanks uh, to all my uh, colleagues for their great talk so far. Um, I'm very glad to um, be given the opportunity today to uh, report on two studies um, that were presented at the ACC virtual event regarding valvular heart disease. And uh, the studies I want to present to you are the popular TAVI trial, which was presented by uh, Vincent Nienhuis um, from the Netherlands that dealt with anti-thrombotic therapy after TAVI. And uh, the second trial, I want to present you another TAVI trial. So it's very focused on TAVI, actually. Um, the second trial I'll present is the partner three low risk randomized trial. And um, I'm going to show you the two year outcomes that were presented by Michael Mack. The study compared TAVI to surgical aortic valve replacement in um, surgical low risk patients. So, first, the popular TAVI trial. This was um, an investigator initiated randomized trial that was held in, in uh, several in four different uh, European countries. Um, and the authors or the investigators sought to include patients that were scheduled for TAVI, so mostly uh, with uh, severe aortic stenosis, that also had a long term indication for oral anticoagulation. And um, the study wanted then to randomize these patients into two groups. On the one hand, the group of only oral anticoagulation or OAC, and on the, the other hand, OAC plus three, three months of uh, clopidogrel. The authors um, planned several study endpoints, um, which I'm going to show you now. Um, the primary endpoints were defined as all bleeding and as non-procedural bleeding. The non-procedural bleeding endpoint is actually every bleeding except the severe bleedings that occurred during the procedure 
but includes uh, all the minor access site bleedings, which is uh, special and which is actually a limitation of the study um, after all. The secondary endpoints um, were defined as composites of CV death, stroke, myocardial infarction, non-procedural bleeding, and another uh, secondary endpoint was defined as CV, CV death, ischemic stroke, and myocardial infarction. This is the so-called um, ischemic of thrombotic endpoint. I would uh, like to show you some of the patient's characteristics, um, especially regarding prior anticoagulation. Um, most of the patients, uh, interestingly, uh, received vitamin K antagonists in both groups, 75.2 um, and 70.5% respectively, and uh, only 23.6% um, and 29.5% received direct oral anticoagulants, uh, which, which is an interesting finding. So let me show you the results of the popular, popular TAVI trial. Um, first, the primary outcome. The study found um, that patients that received oral anticoagulation alone had a significantly lower rate of all bleedings after one year compared to the oral anticoagulation plus clopidogrel group. And this finding was consistent for the non-procedural bleedings. So except the major um, procedural bleedings that occurred. Um, here, there you can see, again, a significantly lower rate um, of non-procedural bleedings in the OAC alone group compared to those patients who received additional clopidogrel for three months. An interesting finding, and um, um, honestly, uh, quite as expected, uh, the most common location was the TAVI access site. As to the secondary outcomes, um, CV mortality and non-procedural bleeding, stroke and myocardial infarction. So there were bleedings included in this secondary outcome um, parameter. Um, here, the OAC alone group still was superior uh, to the OAC plus clopidogrel group uh, with a lower event rate, uh, significantly, um, uh, statistically significant. And um, now regarding the second secondary outcome, the thrombotic or ischemic endpoint. Um, here we see that uh, regarding the endpoint of CV mortality, ischemic stroke and myocardial infarction, the OAC alone group was still non-inferior uh, as compared to the OAC plus clopidogrel group with, and this is now uh, interesting and not as expected maybe, um, with a lower rate actually uh, of events in the OAC alone group compared to those who had additional clopidogrel. So let me conclude for the popular TAVI trial. Um, in patients with indication for oral anticoagulation who undergo TAVI, this study found that OAC alone or oral anticoagulation alone as compared to oral uh, anticoagulation plus clopidogrel reduced the rate of bleeding events, but did not increase, increase the rate of thrombotic events. So as to my uh, figure that I presented to you in the beginning, uh, who is the, the, the winner here between those two groups? I think we have a clear winner. I think it is uh, oral anticoagulation alone. The second study I want to uh, present to you is the, um, the two-year outcomes of the Partner 3 Loris study. This study was uh, also a randomized uh, multicenter trial, um, but the, the most important difference was uh, that this uh, trial is actually funded by Edward. So it's not investigator initiated, it's fund, which is um, uh, an important difference, I think. And, but this study, um, the investigator sought to uh, randomize patients at low surgical risk with severe aortic stenosis into two groups. On the one hand, TAVI, only with uh, the Sapien 3 valve by Edwards Life Sciences, or to surgery. Um, the primary endpoint of the study was a composite endpoint of all cause mortality, stroke, or rehospitalization after one year. And the results of uh, this primary endpoint were um, published last year by Michael Mack uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And just a refresher for you. Um, this study showed superiority of TAVI compared to uh, 
to um, surgical aortic valve replacement for this primary composite endpoint of death, stroke, or rehospitalization at one year. Here you can see uh, the one-year outcomes uh, that I that I just told you. We see after one year, we see a significantly lower rate of events in the composite endpoint for the TAVI patients as compared to surgical patients. And after two years, this was um, presented now, we see that this finding is consistent with a lower event rate in TAVI patients as compared to surgical patients um, with a statistical significance. But if you take rehospitalizations out of this equation and only look at death and stroke um, as secondary endpoints, you can see that actually after two years, we don't see any uh, difference between TAVI and um, surgery after all. While we had a, a statistical, uh, statistical significance, um, the significant uh, difference between TAVI and uh, SEVER after one year, at least for stroke, as you can see here, after two years, this is not the case. Uh, on the other hand, we see um, actually if you if you compare the curves after one year, you see that both curves are getting closer together, indicating uh, a higher event rate uh, even in TAVI patients. Um, these are some other secondary outcomes I would uh, like to share with you. Um, first. There are some uh, expected findings like a new onset of atrial fibrillation, which was more common after one and two years in the surgery group. Uh, we all expected that. On the other hand, uh, conduction uh, disturbances like left bundle branch blocks, uh, those are more common, uh, knownly more common in TAVI patients after one and after two years. Importantly, no difference in uh, the incidence of new pacemaker implantations. This is important. And another um, finding, which is new after two years, I want to uh, stress that, is valve thrombosis. Um, the investigators found, uh, found a higher incidence of valve thrombosis after two years in the TABI group compared to the surgery group with a st uh, statistical significance. However, um, this finding has to um, has to interpret it with caution because the diagnosis of valve thrombosis is based on outdated uh, VARC2 criteria. This was stated by Michael Mack during the presentation as well. Um, these criteria are quite subjective and uh, not really uh, cannot really quantify uh, valve thrombosis. Another um, another fact is that uh, valve thrombosis. Um, or the meaning of valve thrombosis in cl for clinical events is uh, to date is totally unclear and has to be uh, further investigated in my opinion. So let me conclude for the partner three low risk trial after two years. In low risk patients presenting with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, this study found that TAVI with the Sapien 3 valve by Edwards uh, Life Sciences reduced the primary endpoint of death stroke hospitalization by 7%, a finding that was again driven by rehospitalizations and not by stroke and death. On the, other, on the other hand, death and stroke events were increasing between one and two years, leading to no significant difference between TAVI and SEVER at two years for those secondary endpoints. And interestingly, uh, there was an increased valve thrombosis rate in TAVI patients. Um, however, uh, as I told you, this finding uh, is based on outdated criteria uh, with an unknown clinical significance. So to uh, summarize, who is the winner in this race uh, between TAVI and SEVER in low-risk patients? In my opinion, we don't have an answer yet to this question. We need long-term follow-up, um, especially of patients um, with lower surgical risk treated with TAVI. And in this regard, I would like to point your attention to the dedicated trial, which is uh, an ongoing trial uh, funded by the German, uh, the, the German Association for uh, Cardiovascular Research of the German Center for Cardiovascular Research at DZAK. Uh, it's investigator initiated, so it's not funded by uh, a company. It's investigator initiated. It's prospective randomized multi-center study. 
And uh, the most important thing is that it is an all comers study, including all transcatheter heart valves um, used in patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. The study randomizes low uh, to intermediate surgical risk patients to either TAVI or SEVER. Uh, a total of 1,600 patients are planned. And um, this is important, as I told you, the primary endpoint is five-year all-cause mortality, uh, which addresses, as I told you, the, um, the very, very, important, um, very important question of long-term uh, outcome in uh, TAB. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It was, uh, was, was, uh, was great, especially since you addressed one um, very, yeah, a, a question we, we ask ourselves every day, the question of uh, antiplatelet therapy after TAVI implant, um, implants. Um, so we saw that there is no benefit in clopidogrel adding to oral, uh, to oral anticoagulation in patients who have uh, received a TAVI. Um, would you say that that's, that discussion is over? So no antiplatelet therapy after uh, valve implantation, or would you say you know maybe there are some we would still consider uh, giving clopidogrel? Um, I think I think the, the, the first of all this study is very important, and there definitely was uh, definitely was a huge gap uh, in evidence. Uh, regarding antithrombotic uh, therapy after TAVI. So I think with these, uh, these results, I think um, it would be reasonable to, uh, to put patients that have a need, to, um, need for oral anticoagula anticoagulation to put them on anticoagulation and uh, to exclude clopidogrel. However, uh, the study, as I pointed out, has some um, limitations. First, it's the, uh, the outcome, the, the primary outcome of non-procedural bleedings, which included actually all the minor excess uh, bleedings. And this was, um, this was actually uh, also criticized afterwards, after the publication of, uh, of this work. And um, secondly, I think maybe future studies should uh, address endpoints like uh, like presented in uh, I think the one the first uh, first study today that was uh, first presentation today the Tico trial which combined bleeding and ischemic uh, events I think this um, might be interesting and another study um, this uh, that's um, that's that's ongoing uh, actually is the cohort a of this popular Tavi trial and um, this cohort uh, addresses patients with no need for oral anticoagulation, uh, there we still don't know uh, on which treatment we should patients. So um, I think there's uh, there's new evidence now, and we uh, we can learn from that. But uh, I think we uh, several investigations have to be done uh, in the future. Thank you very very much. I think this uh, this is amazing, and I'm uh, not only happy about the talk um, of you today. I'm, I'm also looking forward to the results of the dedicate uh, trial. And uh, I think this uh, is a very promising trial with very interesting data to come. So listen, thank you very much. Best regards to, to Hamburg. Thank you, David. So I would love to conclude and I would love to thank Miroslava um, Valentova and Elham Kevampur um, from Göttingen and from Heidelberg for the great talks. To I would love to thank uh, Thorsten Kessler from Munich Sven Trübs from Mainz, um, Tobias Trippel uh, for his uh, great heart failure talk from Berlin, uh, David Dunker with uh, amazing data on electrophysiology from Hanover, and uh, our last presenter, uh, Sebastian Ludwig from Hamburg on the uh, valvular diseases. Thank you very much. Uh, these were the highlights of the ACC 2020, and I hope you join us for the next meetings.